Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. This is todebate.net. This is another debate, another episode with the same co-hosts, Dirk, who's on video conference right now. We're recording this over video conference, and myself, Sebastian. Good and the generic usual... time of the day, Sebastian. Generic time of the day? What do you mean? Good generic time of the day. Oh, good generic time of the day. <laughs> you forgot the curly brackets. How can I know? The curly right, bracket? Good open curly bracket or whatever it is. Oh, 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 oh that, not, that, not, that, that's a little bit up. too nerdy, I guess. <laughs> oh, I don't know who are already, who, who, I don't know all the members of our audience. Yeah, good but. dollar X. <laughs> um, all right, that is right no. quickly. Now let's fight back to our introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Good the to usual see you. thing, the usual, the u- usual thing. Even though we always talk for about you know twenty minutes, half an hour before we start recording, talking about work and personal stuff, and the the usual thing that we ask each other when we start the recording is, is "How are you?" Which sounds odd because <laughs> to us we already we already chatted. But how are you? Uh, I'm. Better or worse after that we talked off the record. I've, I've been the- I've been worse. <laughs> <laughs> Let's put it that way. I've been worse. Yeah, the, it's an interesting point, right? So we we know fr- we know kind of how we are, but uh, then also we when we open up the mic, we kind of invite our listeners to our little conversation here, and they don't know how we are. So that's probably what we ask that for, right? And we cannot ask our listeners, so we ask ourselves that: How may our listener be right now? I hope he's or she's well. So the what what this reminds me of suddenly um, is that is all this conventional aspect. You know, we ask people around us. I say we in a general form, not necessarily you and I, like how they are. But do we really care about the answer? Like especially when it's work colleagues or people that we don't necessarily see or care that much about. And I know in French, like you know, you you can say comment ça va, and you actually don't even expect an answer. It's just like a way of saying hello. Yeah. Uh, the, the, and I mentioned this because I try to pay attention to the words I use. For instance, I, in other cultures, I've, I've, came, I've come across, and there was an article in The Guardian, I think a year ago, on how often people say thank you. And even though it doesn't say anything about you being kind or not, it's funny that in some cultures, you actually say very little uh, thank you or please, just because it's, maybe, maybe, maybe the behavior is expected, you're supposed to help each other, you don't have to thank them every time. Or in other cultures, you say thank you, but do you really mean it? Do you really actually think about what it means, or do you say please, you know, yeah. likewise? And so it it becomes even more interesting when you have a bit of a double stereotype. So in in Germany, for instance, in German culture, it is a common stereotype when when talking about Americans that Americans ask how are you doing all the time, but they don't care. They are superficial. It's kind of the connotation of that. But the weird thing is, uh, and Germ- you can get you can rail Germans when they make that argument very quickly when you ask them. So, what do you expect as an answer when you are uh, um, ask "Wie geht's dir?" Which is the German equivalent to "How are you doing?" Because Germans ask the same question, and I I bet you Germans don't care either. But they like to complain about Americans <laughs> for not caring. Um, that, it always struck me as funny. At the same time, there is a culture of of complaining if you trigger it slightly different. So um, if you if you if you have the right opening, then it's part of um, a lot of European cultures, I believe, to actually compare uh, complain a little. So the 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 so the in Germany, for instance, in German, for instance, we literally when we when we are happy with what we see, then we say, "Oh, I got nothing to complain." <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, and in in Polish, I know that for a fact uh, because a friend of uh, uh, um, a a common friend of ours uh, shared that with me. In Polish, he would say "no new headaches" or "no new problems," which basically then, means, "oh yeah, all the problems I already know are kind of around me, but there is nothing on top of that," which means, "oh yeah, I'm fine." <laughs> in French, it would be "not bad, pas mal." Yeah. Right? Comment ça va, pas mal? Yeah, I'm not, not bad. bad. <laughs> yeah, and then in 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 uh, our American friends would of course say awesome until something is really really bad, <laughs> and maybe even in, in, then. In which case, it would be fantastic only. Yeah, if it's <laughs> if something terrible happened, then it's only fantastic. <laughs> well, anyway, but uh, the the fact of the matter is, we all have these 
but we we like to point them out in other cultures because they kind of struck us uh, strike us as odd. It feels like. Anyway, so how are you doing? I told you I've been better, but uh, I'm, I think I'm reasonably well. <laughs> And I'm not bad. <laughs> <laughs> We haven't recorded in a long time. Today is not about conventions or the way to greet other people in different cultures. Oh yeah, we trained Actually, our listeners, right? They were they were they were assuming this is all part of exactly, our elaborate of funny transition. It was not, my friend. No, it was a trick. <laughs> uh, well, not an intentional trick. But the, the motion today is actually unrelated to this. The motion was triggered after the, the New Zealand attacks. Uh, and when was it now? A month or two ago now? Two months ago? And uh, the laws in New Zealand were changed immediately regarding gun control. So we thought it would be interesting to debate about whether it is dangerous to change laws immediately after an emotional event. And as usual, we flipped a coin to decide who would be for and against, or against, and who would start. I'm, I'm for and against, and I go first and second, and you can go right. now. We, we because it also means I win would the be debate. For and first, that motion. That's basically what's <laughs> happening. So you will be claiming that it is dangerous to change laws immediately after an emotional event, and I'll be arguing against that. So whenever you're ready, you've got two minutes in case you forgot the <laughs> <laughs> the rules because we haven't the recorded rules, so long but... okay let's do this Dirk goes first and argues for the motion passing laws after emotional events is very tempting for politician because it is after these events that people are most likely to align behind a cause and call for action It's also when the, uh, when politicians can appear the strongest, right? They can immediately act and put something forward and uh, and change something. Politicians are often praised for being active. And if you're a politician who says, oh, yeah, let's wait for a moment and think this through in times of crisis or emotional events, this is usually not the uh, in, a, in a very high regard. So it's very tempting. Especially in modern democracies where generating consent usually is harder than that. Usually you have to go through several rounds of discussion. You have to jump through hoops to get sometimes uh, complex laws in place and you have to compromise and all these things. And all of this immediately gets easier when a child is abducted and killed or something else of that, uh, that sort happened. So why is that a problem? Study after study has proven that when we are at the height of emotions, like anger, like fear, we don't think through consequences. We jump to conclusions. We are very fast in our decision-making. And often, we frankly don't care about the consequences of our actions. Laws are a long-term matter. So if you put a law in place after being under that impression of fear, of, uh, of anger... That law has consequences that outlast whatever event may have triggered it. And that that's a very dangerous aspect of that decision-making that is happening there because it's also a fact of life that emotional events will happen and that there are plenty of people just waiting for the emotional event to happen to just get us pushed into laws that we allow to happen without really spending a time to thinking through consequences. And sometimes we end up with laws that have consequences we, in hindsight, would have better avoided. Now it's Sebastian's turn. Let's hear his argument. Emotional events are not just terrorist attacks, because this is maybe what we think of right away. I'll give you a couple of examples. There was controversy which was sparked when Donald Trump commented on abortion laws, or there was an outraged response from some parts of the population when Obama's administration considered transgender bathrooms in schools. It's just to show, how, show that strong feelings are tightly connected to legal matters and what we want to do and how to organize society. And feeling emotions is intrinsic to who we are as human beings. It allows us to remain sensitive to the pain felt by others. And combining emotions with reason is likely to produce, in my opinion, the best outcome when it comes to regulating, managing, protecting society. It's not only unrealistic to strip, strip emotions away from whatever we try to do, but it's 
not something we should even want to do. I would argue that emotional events act as catalysts. They act as triggers for topics or consideration, considerations of the law that were anyway barely under the surface. They were there, but maybe for some reason the parliament had not acted on it quickly enough and it just you know, got dusted away and the parliament was busy with many, many things in parallel to legislate about. And sometimes priorities can get neglected or we get complacent, lazy. We think we have time to control guns until the worst happens. And then we try to catch up on time, except the victims are real, and thus it's important to finally close the debate. If it had been open in the first place, which I argue most often it was open in the first place for a long time, to avoid another catastrophe. I think the results seem to be here. There's some controversy, I will grant you that. But the results that I'm thinking of is there have been a number of foiled terrorist attacks thanks to the work of the police and the new laws that were enacted in the aftermath of these terrorist attacks like 9-11, but not only. But the change does not need to be substantial. It can correct what perhaps had not been pro properly thought of or done in the first place. It can be tiny adjustments. So overall, I don't think it is dangerous to change the laws immediately after an emotional event. There's many little subtleties and reasons why we want to do this, uh, in particular after an emotional event. <laughs> And now on to Dirk. Let's hear his rebuttal. Yes, I thought about terrorist attacks or crimes, of course, because those are the most prevalent cases where laws are passed right after emotional events. And I agree with you. Today we have more and more discussions and debates played up emotionally in order to manufacture the critical decision-making mass. So people are pushed into strong emotions in order to gather support behind issues. It has multiple downsides, though. Number one, I already mentioned, it's been proven that the more you're emotionally agitated, the less you're inclined to spend time to think through details and consequences, sometimes the nitty-gritty detail that would surface in a proper law-making process. A second downside and problem is not everything really is emotionally engaging. In a world where we require people to be emotionally engaged to pass laws, we are bound to focus on these laws first and sometimes these laws only. And there are just a few things that are not that sexy. There's a reason why we now have a problem with insects that die by the millions and are bound to risk our biosphere, because until recently we just didn't see the, the task of protecting insects as particularly sexy or emotionally engaging. And there are plenty of people that still don't feel that way. So if we wait for emotions to cook up, well, uh, then it may be too late for the insects to stay with that example. And also, it is a wrong guidance or a bad guidance to just wait for the anger or the, the sadness or the, the fear to cook up before you make calls to action or pass laws. And the laws that you pass in that light are also bound to be drafted and pushed by populist agendas by those who feel more extreme because that's another result of study after study that under the impression of fear and anger we tend to be more aggressive faster and harder in our decision making and our punishment so we we form in groups and out groups we attribute reasons differently because something has to replace the careful consideration, thinking, and consent finding if we are just rushing it, which happens in case of emotional situations. So all of this makes a really dangerous cocktail. Having laws in, uh, pushed in place after emotional events can be manufactured first. Sometimes time helps you. Politicians just wait for the emotional event to happen and then push forward their agenda. It happens time and time again. And the, the things that are usually suffering from emotional events and laws that are passed in that context are civil rights, are minority rights, are um, general, um, the, the general culture by increasing punishment level and things like that. 
And often the things that stay on the sidelines because they are just not as emotionally appealing are equally important and we don't pay the proper attention to it. So I do think it's a good thing that usually we need more time to pass laws and it shouldn't be suspended just because something is emotional. Next up, Sebastian. Let me go through the various points you mentioned in your uh, two segments. In your first segment, you mentioned, and you repeated that at the very end of your second segment, you said usually law, laws require several rounds of discussions, and it's a slow-moving process. Well, I'm claiming that in some instances, it doesn't have to be slow, just like, just like we don't need to have emotions to pass laws. I'm not excluding a careful, a careful rational examination of a topic to be able to pass laws. I'm just saying let's not exclude uh, the fast process if we want to, if it's, if it's applicable. And likewise, let's not exclude emotions because, and I'll get back to this, it's just not possible to strip emotions away from our thinking process. I think it's a, it's a traditional, conservative, old-fashioned way uh, of seeing how the human uh, brain works. I think it's very difficult to strip one from the other. And it's funny, it's not funny actually, but I think especially lawyers and judges are specifically uh, resistant to accepting that even themselves are influenced by this. For instance, in their client relationships, you know, they may raise issues of loyalty, anger, frustration, or judges may have had, you know, food or, you know, just after a decision, a making process regarding the punishment of a criminal and may be affected in a different way. So, I think it's very it's a very sensitive top topic for for people working in the legal field, but I think we should not just ignore it because it's sensitive. Another thing you you've mentioned, um, having emotions would would according to you restrict our ability to focus. But I'm I'm not saying we should again just focus on emotions. You can combine it with reason. Let's say you have victims from gun attacks, not terrorist attacks, just some guy with a gun going crazy. I do think lawmakers should probably meet the victims to get a better grasp of what it means to be wounded by bullets. And maybe it would become very emotional. And maybe those who claim that they need a gun to control, uh, to, to be able to, be, to feel safe, maybe would think twice about it. So I think in, injecting a dose of emotions and feelings cannot hurt lawmakers. Insects, you mentioned that it's not as emotionally engaging. Um, on that example, I would say we don't have to wait to be emotionally engaged. I'm just saying when there's an emotional event, maybe it can act as a trigger, right? It doesn't have to be the only reason why we pass laws, but it just may be a reminder that we need to change things. And there's one very salient example, and that was when there was a, an attack in California, San Bernardino. It's the, it's the, it's the guy with his wife, and uh, Apple had been requested to open up the iPhone, and they had refused. Um, so lawmakers seized on the moment and they proposed tons of legislation to take assault weapons out of the hands of shooters and have better reporting of suspected terrorist activity and et cetera, et cetera. But here's the thing, and I'll quote, I think one of the lawmakers saying, for years, this is the quote, for years we have said you can't bring uh, specific magazines, assault rifle magazines into the state. You can't sell them in the state. You cannot ma manufacture them in the state. But if you own one, you can have one. Right, so it was really closing a loophole in the, after the aftermath of that emotional event. So sometimes not just passing groundbreaking legislation, but really fixing details that may have been just overseen, neglected in the past. So I, I'm trying to paint a, a more of a nuanced picture here. It's not a black or white thing. In, inject emotions because it can be useful. Close loopholes because they may have been neglected in the past. It doesn't have to be a radical transformation of society uh, because of, of emotional events. So that's why I don't think it's a dangerous thing. It's just part of our thinking process anyway. So let's face it. Final statements. So in summary, you're saying sometimes after emotional events, we make the right call. Cool. The motion is it is dangerous to change laws immediately after an emotional event. And this doesn't change a bit, even if we sometimes change laws for the better. The fact remains, after an emotional event, it's easier to push people into more extreme actions and people are less inclined to think through consequences. And usually we are rushed and pressed into fast action. 
which often also results us in not putting in the lack work and the research time. Sometimes fast decisions are good. Sometimes fast decisions are useful. I'm not saying that this is not the case. What I'm saying is it's just still dangerous because there are more examples where things were pushed too far or uh, served an agenda that was more extreme than what we liked it to be after an emotional event. That's actually how I want to conclude. It's dangerous to change laws immediately after an emotional event. We are better served by taking some extra time. Sebastian. So my claim is that these emotional events act as useful triggers, as a useful catalyst, and therefore not dangerous. And in democracies, because I think this is what we're talking about in this case, we have these checks and balances. These checks and balances exist. For instance, you have opposition parties. You most In most cases, you have a constitution, constitutional court which validates the, 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 the law and makes sure that it's, a, it's in accordance with the constitution of the country. So I think this gives us enough assurance that even if there's an emotional event that could lead to a dangerous or a risky law that is not properly thought of, I think we have enough checks and balances. And in conclusion, Emotions are intertwined with our reasoning process. So if we, if we think that we can strip them away and suddenly make a good decision, I think we're, we're claiming that in a case of a, uh, that there's no emotional event, that by default the law would be good. And I'm claiming that actually emotions happen all the way. They may be stronger and heightened by a terrorist attack or an emotional event, but that doesn't prevent us from being, from being conscious of it, of realizing that this is an emotional event and maybe thinking through and taking what we can from that, from those feelings and being sensitive to insects or victims of terrorist attack or what have you, to close loopholes. Again, we can be much more nuanced and not change radically the way society evolves. So overall, I don't think it is dangerous, but on the other hand, it's a useful trigger uh, to change laws right after an emotional event. The usual question is, what do you really think? I think it's a slippery slope. I think what we see these, but I mean, we are sitting, you know, the past, in the past 15 or so years, there's a history of increasing levels of data control, surveillance and law enforcement policies creeping up in Europe and the US and basically in all democracies that always have been um, discussed in the context of terrorism. So there is a fear of terrorism that fuels an erosion of civil rights, privacy rights, all these things. That's for me the showcase number one that tells me we are instrumentalized. Our fears are instrumentalized. We are being held in a state of fear and every once in a while, because it's Time works for the, these type of, uh, types of agenda. Whenever there is a terrorist attack happening anywhere in the world, anywhere in the world that we care about, that is, this is used to push that agenda further. So I do think this is a case in point for how dangerous it really is and what, uh, what the result of it is, because history books are also filled with stories how the erosion of civil rights on the grounds of safety and personal security then led to more absolutistic dictatorial systems. That's that's ultimately a fight for democracy, right? So I do really think this is the case. Um, to the point that you made, I do believe, uh, yes, it's also in good hands, it's a useful trigger. So if you, if you can use that momentum to push something through that ought to be pushed through and finally it's unlocked by, um, by people actually caring about something, that, that may be the case. Actually, case in point, New Zealand, I do believe they passed gun laws that were like sitting on the books for a longer time. They just never had the real substantial reason to push them through until that event happened. So the whole thinking process probably happened earlier and the, the government in New Zealand is not an extremism government. They are actually a regular democratic government. So you can argue, well, that's a good thing that this happens. I just sometimes wish we we would have like an automatic, let's say, time limit. If you if you pass a law right after such a emotional event, maybe just put a timestamp on it and say we revisit it in six months. 
and uh, have a proper discussion of it. Or I don't know. I don't know what uh, what would be more useful. But that's really my my personal opinion is um, passing laws after emotional events. May something be, uh, may be a useful tool, but it's a useful tool in the good hands as it is in the wrong hands as well, and that's exactly what the danger is. Do you have examples of, of such laws that you feel are, are were not properly thought of in the aftermath of an emotional event? Uh, for instance, um, we just passed plenty of laws in Europe, and I know it for for a fact in Germany and France that allow police to basically uh, lock you up without without having proper judicial oversight and having a real case in hand on the grounds of a potential threat. And that potential threat is a substantial weakening of what it had to be earlier. Earlier you had to have some proof, an indication, some witness, something. Now you can just say, yeah, somebody f doesn't feel you're you're not dangerous and then police but can what, lock you up was that piece of legislation done in the aftermath of an event or do you would you rather see this as part of a context of taking advantage the, of the last 15 years which have been riddled with uh terrorist attacks here and there right so you just take this psychosis atmosphere and say hey we need protection and security and surveillance and what have you i don't, I don't feel it has been it's necessarily a, the trigger I, triggered by one event in particular but just I, a, I an think, atmosphere i think it was yeah there is an atmosphere but it was specifically there is a process that was triggered specifically by the two big paris uh, or french uh, uh terrorist attacks that we had and the terrorist attack uh, we had in berlin on the christmas market right and these events each one of them triggered a series of changes in police laws you can basically take a look at uh, what happened right in the aftermath And especially in France, I found it very telling. France, the country that basically was the foundation of the civil rights movement, if you will, was on, on emergency laws for, what was it? It was more than a year, right? Not like, uh, so. and this is unheard of. That basically means uh, you're not, you know, the state can stop you from protesting. The state can regulate what journalists are allowed to write. The state can lock you up without any any um, process. And that, that's very dangerous. And that's the aftermath of an emotional event. To, uh, it's slightly a digression, but I found it a little bit funny. But um, indeed, to the point of restricting access of Uh, to journalists to cover, let's say, the uh, Yellow Vest demonstration. There's an independent 20-year-old or 30-year-old journalist in France. I think his name is Gaspard Gantz, if I'm not mistaken. So he has been arrested because police saw him uh, give the middle finger to them under whatever rule or law which you're not allowed to you know, offend someone from the, uh, from the police. Well, it's funny that he was immediately restricted from covering the 1st of May demonstration, which, as you know, is you know a big thing in, in most European countries which, who celebrate Labor Day. And there's continuous yellow vest protest, so he was not allowed to show up at Saturday uh, demonstrations, which have been going on since November in France. Um, so there was an emergency request by his lawyer the day before the 1st of May or two days before to just suspend that. Um, and actually got it suspended by saying there was no, but the judge said there was no real cause. And... He, that, that person, independent freelance journalist, actually got the support from all the established journalists also, uh, which showed that he was re recognized by his peers, not just like some random guy who's not really a journalist, but he's actually recognized. But beyond that, the, the lawyer was also quite sarcastic, saying, yeah, as if you restrict him from demonstrating on Saturdays means, you know, you restrict him from doing a middle finger the rest of the week, right? And why Paris and not the rest of the cities, right? So yeah. uh, the judge had to had to just suspend the... the or cancel the, the initial that's why my, my point my point about this anecdote is that i was happy to see those checks and balances that judges or whatever the court of the i'm not you know an expert on the legal system in every country not even in france but at least there's some checks and balances like you may have police orders or laws but judges will break whatever judgment has been made before because it just doesn't respect the constitution or other laws that's still my hope i'm a bit naive here but otherwise i'm on the same board as you right I, it was a hard tough Uh, a debate for me to defend. That's why I axed my my point around it's difficult to just think you can be rational on one side and emotional on another. I think we're just you know, like animals with hormones and stuff and 
we think we want to be, we, we claim that we are rational, but we're never completely. Yeah. And I'm saying, let's be conscious of it because if we pretend that we're not emotional, we're actually betraying ourselves and whoever elected us if we are in power. So if we recognize this and we use it effectively, I think it can be a useful mechanism. But neglect, that's, that, that, that was my angle of attack, which I can live with. Yeah. But overall, it, I am sensitive. I am like you. But I, I feel very nervous about these. And, I'm, and I'm, I like to think of myself as not very conventional. So every time there's like a default response by society or lawmakers, I, I question myself. In fact, I just started reading the latest book by Brad Easton uh, Ellis called White. Mm-hmm. Uh, white in reference to himself being a white, although he's also gay. But my point is like, or his point rather, is showing how it's crazy the 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 official discourse nowadays is so politically correct. So even voicing out a uh, dissenting opinion will make you have people will have people unfollow you on Instagram, right, or YouTube, or potentially be banned from social media because it's just not conventional. And we're not talking about hate speech, right, or, or calling for violence. We're not talking about this. Yeah. All right. So I, I was curious. I'm reading his book because I had loved American Psycho, the film. I did not read the book. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, um, back to the point about I always question myself when I see a common sheep-like reaction and wonder, wait, right, is this the way we should be going? Yeah, that, so that, I, I'm what, on your board. I'm on your side. What worries me really is that we we are being kept in a we are being instrumentalized in these moments. So whenever there is something happening that has the potential to move big chunks of the population, someone gonna jump in front of that and and will try to use that energy. Sometimes this emotional trigger is even created or played up and uh, it it's just getting hotter and hotter in social media and the shorter our communication and attention span is the the more inclined we are to jump to conclusions and that's yeah that that was what really worried me but on the other hand maybe maybe there are ways to have both right to your point it's it is a useful trigger maybe we should use that to basically schedule a time where we want to have a decision like let's say you feel like an event calls for uh, a discussion on on gun laws and a changed gun law why not saying in a year from now we post a new uh, set of gun regulations and until then we schedule debates and proper process. So basically, you use that emotional trigger to say, yes, we're going to change something. And you're not, not saying what, you got just going to start the process. Well, I'm generally okay with what you're saying. I am reluctant to impose a time limit. And the reason for this is, although there's controversy on the effectiveness of what was passed in the aftermath of 9-11 attacks, I do think in the future, we had other debates circling around the topic. I do think with advancement in machine learning and compute- computational power, I do think that in the aftermath of some terrorist attacks in particular, having special laws, exception laws, which allow you to survey the population in very nasty ways, let's call it that way, but very quickly, may allow to foil further attempts of attacks, which may happen right afterwards, right? So if we had, if we had a year to have a debate, we may miss on the opportunity to, to foil these attacks, which... I agree. There's controversy in the past whether it has actually helped in any way. If it was actually useful to screen passengers in all the airports for liquids and you know nail scissors and what have you, but that was the past. I'm thinking about the future. I'm 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 nervous about restricting and imposing time frame when, when it comes to legislation. I would actually not. Yeah, one way is to impose a time span on how long legislation is in place. The other one would basically. Uh, set a time to start or say we going to touch this uh, law just not now we start in two weeks from now and the process going to take a couple of months and we have proper stages where we have the discussion we require instead of just going in front of microphones and announcing that uh, uh, starting next week the, uh, the whole thing has changed and literally the majority of the population probably uh, probably doesn't even know the text of the law that's being imposed mm. and uh, everything else. So I, it doesn't feel very democratic if you change something on a moment's notice and the people that voted you into power didn't even read the thing. Let us know what you thought of our arguments. You can vote. Go to todebate.eu and you can vote thumbs up, thumbs down, uh, according to whomever convinced you the most. And don't hesitate. You can email us if there's... Uh, a perspective that you have and you'd like to share it, you can email us at uh, mail at todebate.eu that will be sent directly to us. 
So thank you for listening and stay tuned. We'll have other episodes published very soon. Thank, thank you. you Bye. Cheers. Bye-bye.